going to get into this book. This book is called Judah's Scepter and Joseph's Birthright, an analysis of the prophecies of scripture in regard to the royal family of Judah and the many nations of Israel. A Reverend J.H. Allen this is from 1917. Shout out to a new breed who put me onto this book about well, like four or five years ago. And uh, we've been holding this book while well, I've been holding it here and uh, waiting for the right moment. We all were at a level we can understand what we're reading. We've learned so much in the last couple of years, and we're still learning. Now, here are the contents of this book. Uh, first part, uh, literally like telling you biblical uh, history or genealogy and stories. Um, and then the second part is when it you know talks about where they went in regards to the topic that we're going to discuss today, the lineage of Judah and other Israelites in Europe. It says here in uh, part two, chapter five, a royal remnant that escapes. And remember, this is uh, regarding after Nebuchadnezzar had invaded uh, Jerusalem and the king of uh, Judah, Zedekiah, and killed all his male heirs and all of the Judah uh, nobles. So Jeremiah with some of the survivors and the princesses or the king's daughters escaped. As we're going to read here, this Nebuchadnezzar allowed that to happen. So it says here, when Nebuzar Adan or Nebuchadnezzar, this is how it's called here, Nebuzar Adan. Hmm. Dan, the captain of the Chaldean guard, remember who the Chaldeans are, gave Jeremiah privilege to go where he pleased and provided him with all that was needful for the journey. The record further declares, then went Jeremiah unto Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, to Mizpah and dwelt with him among the people that were left in the land. The next verse of the same chapter states that people who were still in the land were the poor of the land, of them that were not carried away captive to Babylon. This Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, was the man whom the king of Babylon had made governor of what little there was left in Judea. For he had taken the masses of the people into captivity to Babylon and made servants of them. It seems that since the capital city of Judea was now destroyed, Gedaliah had been compelled to set up a provincial government in some other city and had chosen Mizpah. But the little province did not prosper long, for the king of Ammon entered into a plot with Ishmael, the son of Netaniah, to assassinate its new governor. Johanan, the son of Karea, discovered this plot and told Gedaliah. However, it was only a short time until the plot was successfully carried out, for Ishmael and nine of his confederates slew not only the governor, but all the Chaldeans, all the men of war, and all the Jews that were with him. Then Ishmael carried away captive all the residue of the people that were in Mizpah, even the king's daughters, oh, oh even the king's daughters, whom Nebuzar Adan or Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, had committed to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Netanya carried them away captive and departed to go over to the Ammonites. When Johanan and other captains of the fighting forces heard what Ishmael had done, they gathered themselves together, started in pursuit, and overtook him at Gibeon. All right, so the story continues. They eventually make it into Egypt. So it says here, We have in this company which has come down into Egypt from Judea, the king's daughters. Since the plural form of speech is used, there are at least two of them. History says, there were three. These are the royal seat of the house of David. Okay, this is from the line of Pharez. Remember that David comes out of, that Zedekiah was part of, that his daughters, right, the surviving uh, female Judah 
descendants or heirs. Again, they are the royal seed of the house of David who are fleeing from the slayers of their father, Zedekiah, the last king of the house of Judah, and the slayers of their brothers, the sons of Zedekiah and princes of Judah, all their brothers, all the male heirs. In company with these princes, as is Jeremiah, their grandfather, whom also Awah has chosen to do the work of building and planting, okay? Jeremiah, again, a sign, just like we got in part one. In the princesses, the prophet has royal material with which to build and plant. In company with Jeremiah and his royal charge, we have Baruch, his faithful scribe, whom experts, genealogists, prove to have been uncle to the royal seed. All right? Uncle. Hmm. Note the expression, that remnant. Example, Jeremiah's for it is he who must build and plant the royal seed. Understand also that Jeremiah and his little remnant were well acquainted with Egypt, and since it was well known to them, it could not have been their final destination. Hence, this escaping royal remnant must journey back to Judea and then with her into an unknown land. Why? For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and they that escape out of Mount Sion, on which were the royal dwellings. The seal of the Lord of hosts will do this, and the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah, royal line, shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. And that's the verse right there. Hear it, O oh, hear it, ye men of earth. Hear it, shall again take root downward, be planted, and bear fruit upward. Be builded where God should tell us, where in his word, and he does. And we're in chapter six now. It says here the prince of the scarlet thread. All right, remember what that means, the scarlet thread. Remember Sarah. Judah had two sons. We got this in part one. One of them was Saraf, the other one was Pharez. He was having these twins with Tamar. And Saraf pulled out his hand first. That means he was going to be the inheritor of the royal line. Since he was coming out first, they put a scarlet thread around his hand. But then Pharez came out first. His brother, he breached out and so got the royal descendancy. And so Pharez is where David comes out of and Zedekiah who got killed. So now... These females are what's left. This is the remnant from that line. So again, there's another line, the line of Saraf that came out second. And this is what they're going to talk about here. It says, while we leave our little royal remnant to make their escape, let us look about and now into the fields of revelation and history to see if we can find some royal prince to whom shall be wedded one of these princesses. Who are fleeing into that unknown land, man. This reminds me of like those movies, you know, like Lord of the Rings, Narnia, you know, all these medieval uh, ro royal uh, kings and queens. This is where they get all those stories from. They're looking for this prince to wed the princesses of Judah, of the line of David, where Hawa has promised that those who compose this remnant shall again take root and grow. While we are making this search, it will be well to remember that Hawa gave the kingdom over Israel to David forever, again to David, to David. And that Israel, Israel, okay, a family, a people, a nation, not everybody, is not the name of the Jewish nation, but that it is the name of the ten tribe kingdom, which had been driven into an unknown land. All right, they're talking about the ten tribes were separated, you know, between Judah and Benjamin, which became, you know, the kingdom of Judah. And they had gone to an unknown land, right? About 139 years prior to the flight of this remnant. So 139 years before Zedekiah got killed, there was another, you know, other tribes of Israel had, had already moved on to other parts of the earth. That's what we went over in part one and many other videos uh, before. Let us also remember that the scepter, with all that belongs to it, was promised distinctively to the Judo Davidic family and not to the kingdom which bore the name of Judah, a name which together with its corrupted form, Jews, is the biblical historic name of the Jewish nation. So what he's trying to say, the word Jew was only applied to Jude or Judeans. It wasn't all the Israelites, just the ones that were from the tribe of Judah. So saying Jews is like a misnomer, you know, uh, especially when you're talking about other uh, tribes of Israel other than Judah. Is it possible that this little royal remnant shall have gone to that same unknown land 
to which they of the ten tribes had previously gone. All right, so he's saying, could this, you know, remnants, you know, Jeremiah and these king's daughters, could they have gone and met up with their brethren, the other tribes, and wherever they had gone, this unknown land? Was it among that people that this remnant was planted, and over whom the preserved scepter held its sway? Let us examine the scriptural evidence. Ezekiel is believed to have lived contemporaneously with Jeremiah. By taking the testimony of chronology together with the concurrence of many historic events, all may know that this is true. Jeremiah states historic events and utters prophecies which relate chiefly to Judah, but gives only a little of that which pertains to Israel. While Ezekiel does the reverse of this, saying much that concerns Israel and but little that pertains to Judah. Still, what he does say concerning the destroyed commonwealth of Judah, the plucked up scepter and the overturned throne of that royal family whose history we are studying does most undoubtedly furnish evidence which connects the remnant seed and their monarchical belongings with the exiled house of Israel, which has taken root and whose people are gathering strength in a country, the location and geographical character of which are described by the prophets and which at a time prior to the prophecies was an unknown and uninhabited wilderness. We have no disposition to make an attempt to give words a meaning which they will not bear, nor to attach any signification to them, which the context does not clearly indicate. But these words do most certainly give us to understand that there is a person, a male heir of the royal line, who is to be the immediate successor of Zedekiah to the Davidic throne. Also, these words teach that the crown is to be taken from off the head of Zedekiah, upon who it rested at the time when this prophecy was given, and placed upon the head of this person whom the scriptures designate as him that is low. These words further teach that when the royal diadem, the emblem of kingly power and exaltation is taken from the one and placed upon the head of that other person, that then the one who was previously high is abased and brought low, but that the one who hitherto was low and then exalted and made high. This is essentially so, because the two men shall have then exchanged places. Furthermore, the expression, this shall not be the same, taken together with the prophecy concerning the overturns, leads us to expect a change of dynasty, at least on the side of the male line, and also a change in the territorial or geographical situation. Again, a change in the male line. This is still more apparent when we note that there are to be three overturns, and that after the third overturn shall have been accomplished, there are to be no more until another certain person comes. Also, after the diadem has been removed from the head of the prince who wore it at the time of the first overturn and placed upon the head of him that is low, it is to be noted that then either this man, who is the person understood as the antecedent of the personal pronoun, him or his lineage, is to be dethroned by the Hawa in favor of that other person who is designated as he whose right it is, to whom it shall then be given. The next question for us to settle is, who is this legally possible person that is to be the successor of Zedekiah, who is spoken of as him that is low, for he is spoken of as low only in the sense of non-ruling? By consulting the 38th chapter of Genesis, we will find a record of the conception and birth of twin boys, whose conception and birth were both accompanied by such extraordinary circumstances that the question of their parentage is forever settled. For Tamar, the mother did willingly stood in order that she might conquer Judah, the father, and compel him to do justice by her. The never-to-be-forgotten manner in which Judah was forced to acknowledge that those children were his offspring. I right? remember what happened. Tamar, you know, made him think she was a harlot and made him had, you know, because he had promised his third son and she, he never did it. So she made him get her pregnant. And that's what they're talking about right here. The never-to-be-forgotten manner in which Judah was forced to acknowledge that those children were his offspring and that their mother was more righteous than he does most certainly place the fact of their royal lineage beyond the possibility of cavil. When the mother was in travail and after the midwife had been summoned, there was the presentation of a hand. Then for some reason, either human or divine, the midwife knew that twins were in the womb. So in order that she might know and be able to testify which was born first, she fastened a scarlet thread on the out 
reached hand, all right? So this is Sarah. Sarah pulled out his hand first. So she put a scarlet thread, to, you know, to signify this was the one that, you know, had come out first. Since Judas was the royal family in Israel and the law of primogeniture prevailed among them, it was essential that this distinction should be made so that at the proper time the firstborn or eldest son might ascend the throne. After the scarlet thread had been made secure on the little hand, it was drawn back and the brother was born first. Uh-oh, you see what happened? That was uh, Perez. Upon seeing this, the midwife exclaimed, How hast thou broken forth? How did you do that? Then seemingly she was filled with the spirit of prophecy and said, This breach be upon thee. And because of this prophetic utterance, he was given the name of Perez. Example, a breach, all right? Perez. That's where David comes from. Afterwards, his brother, who had the scarlet thread upon his hand, was born, and his name was called Sarah, the seed, the seed. And that's very deep because he does become the seed. The very fact that Perez was really born first would exalt him, and it eventually did exalt his heirs to the throne of Israel, for King David was a son of Judah. Through the line of Fares, okay, through Fares, but it was supposed to be Sarah first, but Fares came out first. You guys get it? But just so surely as this son of Judah and father of David, who was the first one of the line to sit upon that throne, was given the name of Fares, just so surely must we expect with that little hand of the scarlet thread waving prophetically before them that a breach should occur somewhere along that family line. That breach did occur. We are now considering his history and are well into his transition period, which began when Hawa sanctified Jeremiah, sent him into the world, and gave him his commission to pull down and pluck up the exalted Fares line, and afterward to build and plant a new deceptor throne and kingdom, while at about the same time the word of Hawa came to Ezekiel and moved him to predict the removal of the crown from the head of one who is high, a proceeding which not only involves the transfer of the royal diadem to another head, but also an overturning. And when both the transfer and the overturning shall have been accomplished, then the one who was low will have been exalted, and the exalted one will have been brought low. The immediate posterity of this prince of the scarlet thread is given as follows. Okay, the prince, male line, from Sarah, scarlet thread, and the sons of Sarah, Simri and Ethan, Heman, we get the Tyrians we read in the last video, right? Chalco or Chalco, we get a line in uh, Ireland where Elcoid, Heramon eventually comes out of. And we got Dara or Darda, where we get the Dardanians or Dardanos, the founder of the royal line of Troy. Five of them in all. This is the verse right here. Thus, direct posterity of Sarah was five. While that of Fares was only two. Sarah had more kids, more males to, you know, spread the seed. For the reason that David sprang out of Judah through the line of Fares, the unbroken genealogy of that family is given in the sacred records. But the genealogy of the Sarah family is given only intermittently, okay? That's not really known. What happened to the line of Sarah and their descendants? Where are they? One thing is made quite clear in the Bible concerning the sons of Sarah, and that is that they were famous for their intelligence and wisdom. For it was only the great God-given wisdom of Solomon which is declared to have risen above theirs, as is, as is seen by the following. And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding, and Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the East, for he was wiser than all men, than Ethan, the Ezrahite, and Heman, and Calco, and Dara. All right. Again, those are Sarah's sons. So he's saying they were comparing Solomon uh, basically to Sarah's sons. They were wise kids. They were wise people. Furthermore, we find that two of them, Ethan and Heman, were also noted singers. Singers, as we find by consulting the 15th chapter of 1 Kings and the 19th verse, by noting the titles of the 88th and 89th Psalms, we also see that one of them was composed by Heman, the Ezraite. And that the other was the song of Ethan, the Ezraite. It is not at all unlikely and would be but natural that the Simri, who overthrew Basha, the third king of Israel, not Judah, 
belong to the posterity of Simri, the firstborn son of Sarah. All right, it's a Judah, all Judah, son of Judah and twin brother of Phares. For as we have shown, the seed of Jacob were at that time divided into two kingdoms, with the posterity of Phares on the throne ruling over the kingdom of Judah. How natural it would be for the then living members of that family to think and to say, this is the long foretold breach for which we have been taught to look. This is the time to assert our royal prerogatives. Take the throne and rule over this, the house of Israel. All right, we move on to chapter seven real quick. The Prince of the Scarlet Thread and the Royal Remnant united. The two lines united. All right, so basically we got the story, you know, they're about to meet up. The two lines, where does that all happen? It appears to happen in Ireland. Just like we left off in uh, part one. It is well known fact that the history of no country on the face of the earth has so puzzled historians as that of Ireland. There is both a sacred and secular reason for this. The secular reason is that Ireland steps into the arena of history with a monarchical kingdom running in full blast. And men do not know how it got there. The sacred reason is, is because Hawa has issued a mandate saying, Keep silence before me, O islands, and let the people renew their strength. Keep this silent until they can build up again. We have read many authors on the subject of the Hebrews in Ireland who claim to have searched carefully and critically through all available chronicles, records, and histories, and they all agree that a perusal of these various authorities is not only heavy reading, but that they are very obtuse and that they are actually confusing, bewildering, and tormenting to all who do not take the word of Hawa as an ally in the work of unraveling their mysteries. You gotta use scripture to help you understand what you're reading in these ancient annals of Ireland and Wales and Scotland. For all of these authorities do agree and state in the following facts. About 585 BC, a notable man, an important personage, a patriarch, a saint, an essentially important someone, according to their various ways of putting it, came to Ulster, the most northern province of Ireland, accompanied by a princess. So a very important man coming with a prince. This is their stories. This is not from the Bible. But you know what they're talking about, right? We're talking about Jeremiah and the daughters of Zedekiah, the daughter of an eastern king. And that in a company with them was one Simon Brock or Breck. Brak, Barak, remember Baruch, Barak, as it is differently spelled, and that this royal party brought with them many remarkable things. Among these was the harp, remember the harp of David, an ark, remember the ark, and the wonderful stone called Lyophel, remember Jacob's pillow or the stone of destiny, of which we shall have much to say hereafter. This eastern princess was married to King Eremon. Remember, Eocoid Heramon. She married him. That's where we left off in the last video, right? On condition made by this notable patriarch that he should abandon his former religion and build a college for the prophets. This Heramon did, and the name of the school was Murolam, which is the name both in Hebrew and Irish for school of the prophets, okay? It's the same thing in Hebrew and Irish and Gaelic, and we're going to see a book, right, that's going to prove it's the same thing. The Gaelic and all this, Celt, what do you want to call Celt? Has Hebrew roots, so-called Hebrew. He also changed the name of his capital city a lot there. Sometimes spelled Kater, Crofton, to that of Tara. The name of this eastern princess is given as T. Tefi, all right? Queen Tefi. And it is well known fact that the royal arms of Ireland is the harp of David. And has been for 2,500 years, okay? This is the history they don't tell you. Ezekiel in his riddle was speaking of the coming of the female passenger who came to that land in the second vessel, whom he afterwards proves to be a princess, speaks of the furrows of her plantation. It is a truth, and to us a marvelous one, that the province of Ulster used to be called the plantation of Ulster. As anyone may know, if they will take the trouble to consult Chambers' Encyclopedia on the word Ulster. Further, the crown which was worn by the sovereigns of that hitherto unaccounted for kingdom in Ireland at twelve points. Who shall say that the king's daughter was not planted there? 
and that the first of the three of Ezekiel's prophetic overturns was not from Palestine to Erin, right? From America to Erin, from America, ancient, ancient Canaan, right? The true promised land. This book is called Judah's Scepter and Joseph's Birthright. And we go to chapter two of part three of this book. We're on page 230, and it says here, Jacob's pillow, pillar stone. When the Abrahamic covenant promises were given to Jacob, he was making a journey from Beersheba to Pandan Aram, all right? So if you don't know the story behind Jacob's pillow, we're about to learn it now. He had but recently received from his father Isaac the blessing, which carried with it those much desired covenants and the special blessings and promises which pertained to them. When Isaac gave this blessing to Jacob, he told him not to take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. All right, he was not supposed to do that. Remember what he did, the land in which they were then living, but to go to Laban, his mother's brother, and to take a wife from among his daughters. It is hardly to be supposed that Jacob was traveling entirely alone, for that was not the Oriental custom. We learn from incidental remarks that are dropped elsewhere in reference to this journey that he had with him a tent which was pitched at night and that the journey was made on foot where he walked with a staff. The sacred record deals chiefly with that which took place between Jacob and Hawa with but the slightest incidental mention of details as concerning a certain sundown and stones for pillows. The first mention of stones for pillows which a reference to this occasion is plural. But suddenly, one of those pillows, stones, is brought into great distinction. The fact which brought that special stone into such prominence may be quickly read, for the Bible account of them is very short. But we doubt whether many who have read the record of those facts realize their true symbolic import. We doubt also whether we shall be able to explain, even approximately, not only the great distinction which has been bestowed upon that stone as a symbol, but also the exalted place it has occupied ever since it came into historic notice, or the supreme greatness of that position to which prophecy declares it shall yet be raised. If we read the prophets aright, no such glorious prominence, highly honored use, or divinely declared purpose has ever been given to any other inanimate thing on the earth as that which is yet in reserve. For that special pillow stone upon which Jacob rested his head on that certain night when he camped before Luz while on his way to Pandan Aram. It seems to have been the custom among Oriental travelers when they pitched their tents for the night to take stones for headpieces or bolsters in order to raise that part of their bedding on which their heads rested to a comfortable position for rest and sleep. At least this is what Jacob did. As he slept, he dreamed. In his dream, he saw what is called a ladder, all right? This is Jacob's ladder, all right, the story, but which may be called a staircase or an open way that reached from earth to heaven, for the top of it reached to heaven. The angels of Hawa were ascending and descending by this existent way, which for the time was made visible to the inheritor of the covenant promises. And at the top, above all that throne of radiant commerce and goers, the Lord stood and gave Jacob the full text of the covenants as formerly given to Abraham and Isaac. All right, so that's the story where the stone comes from. So he was using it as a pillow while he having this dream where I was talking to him and saying, hey, you are the seed now. You are, you know, I'm making my covenant with you now. So same speech he gave to Abraham and Isaac, right? Now he's giving it to him in a dream, almost like, you know, think about the movie Wakanda, right? When they go and it goes visit their ancestors. So the same thing. So, you know, upon hearing this, it says, it continues, times he wakes up, you know, all startled, all, all afraid, but all happy, all excited of this heavenly vision, pressed by the weight of responsibility, yet encouraged by the drawn-in gladness in his heart, and moved by the spirit of prophecy, took the stone upon which his head had rested and set it up for a pillar of witness, all right? So that's what ended up happening. So he grabbed the stone. It became a symbol for him, a special symbol. He made it a pillar. All right, so it keeps going about where Jacob did and ended up after that. But I want to get to the points of the stone, right? It says, now one point is settled beyond the possibility of doubt that is that Bethel was a part of the inheritance which fell to the house of Joseph when the land of Canaan was divided among the children of Jacob. Okay, that was saying here, carry this stone. It became 
an inheritance, a special thing that needed to pass down. This brings us to a vital point concerning the subject in hand, namely, that not only Bethel, the city or place, but also that Bethel, the pillar rock, was given to the birthright family, and that Israel carried that rock with them into Egypt and in their subsequent journeyings in the wilderness. Okay, so Israel is the one that had the stone of destiny, not Judah. All right, so the stone eventually was uh, given to Joseph. Joseph got the blessing and the covenant passed down to the birthright. So basically, the stone is being passed down. It's becoming a thing, right? This is, this is a tradition. So eventually, the stone ends up, you know, with the royal family, which was, you know, still Zedekiah. And um, so Jeremiah and the daughters actually ended up taking the stone, as he says here. We must also remember that Jeremiah and his little remnant were taken against their will and against the direct command of God to Egypt, and that while there they dwelt in Tamphonkis. Maureen W. Spencer says, It is an undeniable historical fact that about 580 B.C., example, the very time of the captivity of the Jews in Babylon, that a princess from the east did arrive in the north of Ireland. Her name was Tephi, a pet name like Violet, denoting beauty, fragrance. T. Tephi was her full name, found in Hebrew. The T, a little one, and Tefi, answering to a surname. Taf, the root word, is used in many scriptures. So you can find Taf is what they're saying. You know, that's Tefi in the Bible. And this is the verses. Her names were interchangeably used as T, Tafe, Tafis, Tefi, the Eastern Princess, the daughter of Pharaoh, the T Tefi. Either of these served to identify her as the king's daughter. In Egypt, she was offered protection. And from her city of Tafanhis, or Dabnai, was named Doubtless. And to this day, we are shown the site of the palace of the Jews' daughter by the Arabs. The fact that she fled the country is still preserved in her name, Tarang, meaning one, banish or flight. The name of Pharaoh is neither a given nor a surname, but it is the Egyptian name for king or monarch. The very fact that Irish historians call T. Tefi the daughter of Pharaoh is proof that they knew her as the king's daughter. Also, this name, the king's daughter, is the only one used in the Bible account of the first overturn to designate that daughter of Zedekiah, who succeeded him to the inheritance of David's throne, excepting, of course, that metamorphical name, Tender Twig, of Ezekiel's riddle, since the name T means little one. And since a tender twig is also a little one, it certainly takes no great stretch of faith to believe that these two names belong to one and the same person. Especially in this, the case when we consider that in the T. Tefi of Irish history, we have a king's daughter with a Hebrew name who not only came from the east, but also from Egypt, all right, America, to Mary, and who is the daughter of a Jew or a Judah, right? But there are still other facts connected with the arrival of this princess in Ireland, which we considered will strengthen our faith more and more. T. Tefi was accompanied by an aged guardian who was called Olam Fola, okay? Olam Fola. More Hebrew words which mean revealer or prophet. The prophet was accompanied by a man who was his scribe, whom the chronicles of Ireland called Brug or Brook. All right, that's Baruch right there. Look how similar it is. It's the same story, guys. You guys see? Baruch was Jeremiah's scribe. While they were in Judea, he went with the little remnant to Egypt and escaped when the rest did. For his life, like the lives of the rest of his party, was to be preserved in all places whither he should go. This little company disappeared from Egypt, but surely they reappeared in Ireland for marvel of marvels or right? i remember before they got to ireland they went through you know a lot of parts like the Gretchen lands and all this other stuff they brought with them a pillar stone all right so they're the ones who brought the pillar stone over to ireland this jacob's pillow we got the backstory which has ever since been used as the coronation stone of the kingdom all right as part of the coronation of the kings till this day is in the british throne later t sometimes spelled tea Tevi herself was crowned upon this pillar stone. She even used it. And the name of Aaron's capital was changed from Kater Krofin to Tara, which is also another Hebrew word. But at this juncture, history comes to our help, and with unquestioned authority declares that from that time until their present, every king and queen who has reigned in Ireland, Scotland, or England 
has been crowned upon that self same pillar or coronation stone, okay? This is Jacob's pillow they've been using. Queen Victoria herself was twice crowned upon that stone, the first time as Queen of England and the second time as Empress of India. Empress of India, huh? What India? On the occasion of Queen Victoria's coronation, June 28, 1837, an article appeared in the London Sun, which gives a description of the coronation chair and the coronation stone as follows. This chair, commonly called St. Edward's chair, is an ancient seat of solid hardwood, with back and sides of the same, variously painted in which the kings of Scotland were in former periods constantly crowned, but having been brought out of the kingdom by Edward I in the year 1296, after he had totally overcome John Baliol, King of Scots, it has ever since remained in the Abbey of Westminster, and has been the chair of which the succeeding kings and queens of this realm have been inaugurated. It is in height 6 feet and 7 inches, in breadth at the bottom 38 inches, and in depth 24 inches. From the seat to the bottom is 25 inches. The breadth of the seat within the size is 28 inches, and the depth 18 inches. At 9 inches from the ground is a board supported at the four corners by as many lions. Between the seat and this board is enclosed a stone, commonly called Jacob's. Listen, listen, this is a guy telling you the 1800s, they're telling you 1837 and her coronation. They're writing this. They're saying that in this chair that they've been using to coronate all their kings that they got from the Scots, who they got from the Irish. Remember, Jeremiah brought it. In this seat, it's enclosed a stone, commonly called Jacob's, or the fatal marble stone, which is an oblong of about 22 inches on left, 13 inches broad and 11 inches deep, of a steel color mixed with some veins of red. History relays that it is the stone whereon the patriarch Jacob laid his head in the plains of Luz. They're even telling you they knew that. This, as you see, was published more than 60 years ago. So this is, you know, 60 years after 1837 that this book was written, I guess, the first time. Before it was thought possible that the Anglo-Saxons were the descendants of Joseph. Remember Saxon? What it means? Sons of Isaac, right? Letting you know right here, too. Descendants of Joseph, the inheritor of the birthright blessing which God gave to his fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This article further says that this stone was conveyed into Ireland by way of Spain about 700 years before Christ. From there, it was taken into Scotland by King Fergus about 370 years later. And in the year 350 BC, it was placed in the Abbey of Scone by King Kenneth, who caused a prophetical verse to be engraved upon it, of which the following is a translation. Okay, this is what it says. Should fate not fail, where this stone is found, the Scotch shall monarch of that realm be crowned. This antique regal chair, having together with the golden scepter and crown of Scotland, been solemnly offered by King Edward I to St. Edward the Confessor in the year 1297, from whence it derives the appellation of St. Edward's chair, has ever since been kept in the chapel called by his name, with a tablet affixed to it, whereon several Latin verses are written in old English characters. The stone maintains its usual place under the seat of the chair, Prior to the time that King Kenneth had his verse engraved on that coronation stone, there was a prophetic verse which had attached itself to it, which Sir Walter Scott has rendered one word accepted as follows. Unless the fates are faithless grown, and prophet's voice be vain, wherever is found this sacred stone, the wondrous race shall reign. Think of it. For more than 700 years, this stone has been in Westminster Abbey, Dean Stanley in his Memorials of Westminster Abbey says, the chief object of attraction to this day to the innumerable visitors to the Abbey is probably that ancient Irish monument of the empire known as the Coronation Stone. He calls it a precious relic and says that King Edward I said that it is one primeval monument which binds together the whole empire. The Dean further adds, the iron rings, the battered surface, the crack, which has all but rent its solid mass asunder, bear witness to its long migrations. It is thus embedded in the heart of the English monarchy, an element of poetic, patriarchal, heathen times, which like Ariana's stretching floor, 
in the midst of the Temple of Solomon carries back our thoughts to races and customs now almost extinct, a link which unites the throne of England with the traditions of Tara and Iona, and connects the charm of our complex civilization with the favors of Mother Earth, the stalks and stones of savage nature. Faithful or foolish, the sentiment of the nation has, through the 300 generations of living men, made it felt that Jacob's pillar stone was a thing worth dying for in battle. By the Treaty of Northampton in 1328, the emeralds, pearls, and rubies were carried off without a murmur. But the ragged old stone, oh no, the Londoners would have died for that. The stone of scone, on which it was the custom for the kings of Scotland to be set at the coronation, the Londoners would on no account suffer to be sent away. Dr. Poole says, this stone is a dull reddish or purplish sandstone, with a few small embedded pebbles. One of these is quartz and two others of a dark material. The rock is calc carios, and is of that kind which masons call freestone. Chisel marks are visible on one or more of its sides. There is no rock of this kind in England, Ireland, or Scotland. All right, that doesn't, it's not from there. But the Reverend Canon Tristram says that there is a stratum of sandstone near the Dead Sea, just like this stone, which by the English people is called Jacob's Pillow Stone. Now, you know I'm going to investigate if this stone also exists in the Americas, because that's going to, you know, show you and it's probably a lot more of that found in the Americas, I bet. This stone is called by the Irish and by the Scotch Lyle Fell and the Stone of Destiny. In Irish, Lyle is stone and Fell is fate, hence the Stone of Fate or the Stone of Destiny. But it is that only because it is Jacob's pillar, pillar stone. This is the reason that T. Teffy was called the daughter of God's house, Log or Lug, Celtic for God, and Eid a house, hence the word Lugite, a merchant chief bar to King Dermot, monarch of Ireland in the 6th century, in the notes of the annals of the four masters refers to T. Teffy as follows, the rampart was raised around her house, for Thea, the daughter of Lugain, she was buried outside in her mound, and from her it was named T. Moore. The parentage here assigned to T. Teffy could have been for no other reason than that she was the daughter of God's house to the people to whom she brought God's house, the stone, which was their shepherd stone, example, Bethel. Morin W. Spencer says that Leah, sometimes spelled Leah, is an Irish word and means a stone, but that fail is Hebrew and is itself a scripture word and is of the deepest import, for it means wonderful and is so translated in Isaiah 9.6. This we have verified. And it clinches our thought that the Bethel stone or Lyophel, the stone wonderful, is indeed a symbol of the divine rock, that wonderful one, the rock of our salvation. The fact that there are iron rings in the stone which is in the coronation chair and that they are worn is remarkable. The question arises, how and when were they worn? It could not have been in the royal halls of Tara, nor in the abbey of Scone, nor since it came to Westminster, nor in the temple of Jerusalem, but surely it could have been when for 40 years Israel journeyed through the wilderness and had both literal and spiritual drink from their shepherd rocks that followed them. So further down the book, we see that the stone eventually ends up in Ireland in a place that was renamed to Tara, where Jeremiah and the king's daughters uh, planted themselves, literally, so they called it a plantation of Ulster. Through Titefi and Jeremiah's word, the king's daughter, and then they say the second overturn or the change of power was from Ireland to Scotland through Fergus, who sent for the Lie of Fail or the Stone of Destiny and had it brought from Tara to Iona, where he was crowned. And then the third, you know, exchange of power, the scepter, the third overturn was from Scotland to England. At this time, the throne was brought from Scotland and placed in Westminster Abbey, where it rests under the protection of the greatest monarchy on earth. <laughs> so that's where, you know, I guess the uh, stone, Jacob's Pillar, ended up. And so this coronation stone, which is in Westminster, which the English called Jacob's Pillow, and which their Scotch and Irish ancestors called God's House, Bethel, the Stone of Destiny, and Leag Fell, the Stone Wonderful, we say, if this stone is indeed what these names and what its history declared to be, then it is indeed the veritable throne of Israel upon which the sons of David were formerly crowned. 
in the temple of God at Jerusalem. Consequently, in this also God has kept faith with David and preserved his throne through all generations that are past. All right, so this is the uh, famous coronation chair, as you guys can see. Old picture and one in color right here. You can see the stone under the chair where they sit. That's Jacob's pillow. That's the one that he fell asleep on, had his dream. He saw the ladder, the one they carried all over the place until they reached Ireland, Ulster from there. Made its way to Scotland on the way. All the Irish kings and the Scottish kings used it for their coronation. Then it went to England, where they've been using it till this day for their coronation. The famous stone of destiny, Jacob's pillow. It's right here. This is a real thing. It's ain't just about religion. It's talking about a lineage, a real people, a chosen people. This book is called Judah's Scepter and Joseph's Birthright. But just real quick, chapter 4 of part 3, it says here, Dan the Serpent's Trail. And it's a whole chapter on Dan, you know, where he started off, where he ended up in uh, Asia and Europe, and then eventually in Ireland and his role, you know, and all this. Uh, we're not going to go through all the part because we got the day and night videos already. If you haven't checked out my day and night videos and all the history of that, because they're going to repeat all this. We're going to get to a specific part. So Billy Flop right here says, for the people who are known by all historians to have been the first settlers of Ireland are called Tuata de Danans, which literally means the tribe of Dan. These Danans of Ireland correspond to the Danaoi of the Greeks and the Latin Danaus and the Hebrew Dan, okay? Again, check out my Danite videos. That Dan's leap landed him in Ireland is evident, for in that island we find to this day Dan's low. Don Sower, Don Monism, Don Dalki, Dundrum, Donegal Bay and Donegal City with Don Glow and London Derry, just north of them. But there is also Dingy, Don Garvin, and Duns More, which means more Duns. And really, there are so many more that we have no space for them, except to mention Dangon Castle, where the Duke of Wellington was born, the Dukes, right? Dukes. And to say that Dun in the Irish language means just what Dan means in the Hebrew, example, a judge. All right, a judge. Who's the judges? The Danites, right? It is remarkable that there is not only a river Don in Scotland, but also a river Dune, and that there is also a river Don in England. Also, that these countries are as full of Dans, Dons, and Duns as Ireland, or in them are not only such names as Dundee, Dunkirk, Dunbar, Dunraven, and many others. But the name of Dan, the son of Jacob, son of Isaac, son of Abraham, lies buried in the name of their capital cities. Example, Edinburgh and London. Surely Dan has danned or judged among his people and thus fulfilled the sure word of prophecy. We are told that in the days of Solomon, every three years came ships of Tarshish. Okay, remember in part one, we read the other book talking about that Tarshish resembles a lot of the British Isles when it came down to commerce and, and the trade they had with metal all over the world from Tarshish. 860 years before Christ, we are told that Jonah went to Joppa, a seaport within the borders of Dan, and found a ship going to Tarshish and that he took passage in it to go to Tarshish from the presence of Kawa. Just how long the ships of Palestinian seaports had been replenishing or colonizing the Isles, even before the Assyrian captivity of the Ten Tribes, is not known. But historians place the time as early as 900 B.C. All right, so they're saying that's how long possible Hebrew or Israelites have been going to Ireland before Jeremiah got there with the king's daughters or, you know, Zedekiah's daughters of the line of Judah and David. So this gives abundant time for some prince of the Sarah branch, remember, the brother's line of Judah's family to have preceded Israel to the Isles. And to have had a large colony even before the birthright went to Assyria. An event which did not occur until 721 BC. That one of those princes did precede Israel to the Isles of the sea is evident. First because Awah says he did. And second because it is recorded in the Malaysian records of Ireland. Okay, Malaysian records. You want sources that the prince Heramon to whom T. Tefi was married 
was a prince of the Tuatha de Danans, okay? So he's not just from the Sarah line, but he's also a Danite. Yes, Ilkoit, the Heremon, who got with Titefi from Sedekiah, he was also a Danite. He wasn't just Judah. Mark this. If that prince was a prince of the tribe of Dan, and authentic history declares he was, then he was a prince of the family of Judah. For there can be no prince of Dan other than a prince of the royal family of his race. Okay, so you remember, you got to be Judah to be able to be a king. The scepter will always be with Judah. So he's saying, so even if he's Dan, he has to be of the family of Judah. And that family has but one fountainhead. Example, Judah, the fourth son of Jacob and Leah, to whom pertains the scepter blessing. But this rule seems to have worked both ways for the family and sign of Judah is a lion. And since one of his whelps, young lion, went to the northwest Isles with Dan, Again, with Dan, one important thing we're learning is that out of the Israelite tribes, not all of them were seafarers. Some of them were. Uh, Dan, I believe, Sebulon was, and another one. You know, there's a couple of them. And so when these Israelites, a lot of them who weren't seafarers, they were going with Dan always, just like Jeremiah and the king's daughters. They ended up going with Danites. Uh, those were the seafarers that brought them to these places. So again, they're saying... A young lion went to the northwest Isles with Dan. As a matter of course, the ensign of his family, the royal family, went with him. Thus, it became associated with the Tuatha de Danans, the tribe of Dan, and in time found its way into their national seal. See the accompanying cut. So this is the image she's talking about right here, okay? And that's the lion. And you've seen this in a lot of family crests, right? It's almost like the lion that looks like a dragon. The figure on this seal is described as a lion's whelp with a serpent's tail. Okay, a lion drakan. The largest of these represent Denmark and the other two, Norway and Sweden, which were at that time under the dominion of Denmark. But continuing the book, Judah's Scepter and Joseph Birthright, an analysis of the prophecies of Scripture in regard to the royal family of Judah and the many nations of Israel. So here, chapter 5, Israel and the Isles. So as we have brought you through this group of words to show that ish in Hebrew means a man, ish. Now take the Hebrew word, which is translated covenant, which in its original form has no vowel, but which in its anglicized form retains a vowel I to preserve the Y sound. And we have brith, which joined with ish is brith ish. All right, brith ish, covenant man, covenant man. And means a covenant man. Today, the British people, or men of the covenant, all right, are called Britons and are dwelling in the British Isles. That's what British means, guys, okay? And it's Hebrew and means a covenant man or the people of the covenant. We are told that the people of Wales called themselves an ancient Welsh Brith or Briton or Brith of Briton which means the covenanters of the land of the covenant. The first form of this phrase is almost vernacular Hebrew. It is also unmistakably recorded in British history that the earliest settlers in Wales and southern England were called Simone, okay, from Simeon, the tribe of Simeon, okay? So these are future videos when we start emphasizing on each particular tribe and nation and where they went, their trajectory, who they could have been in history. And as you guys can see here, little preview, the earliest settlers of Wales, right, of the Welsh were the Simoni from the tribe of Simeon. They came by the way of the sea in the year 720 BC. At this time, there was the greatest influx of the Tuatha de Danan to Ireland. All right, so I just want to mention, uh, I remember the Simeon also of uh, seafaring tribe. And this synchronizes with the deportation of the Israelites of the Commonwealth of Ephraim to Assyria and the flight of Dan and Simeon from the seaports and coast country of the Palestine. So remember that Dan and Simeon bounced on their brothers when the Assyrians took, uh, you know, took them captured. This is real history, real people. That Simoni is the plural of Simeon. We need scarcely mention, okay? We continue in the book, Judah's Scepter and Joseph's Birthright, in chapter 7 of part 3. It says here, studying Scarlet. Remember the Scarlet Thread, they're talking about Sarah and his line. And they're going to try to go ahead and tell you who Eokoid, Heramon, is. You know, the guy who 
married the daughter of Sedekiah to continue the scepter, the line, the royalty, to keep it going. And given further proof concerning that prince of the scarlet thread, whom historians tell us was married to T. Tefi, the eastern princess, we know of nothing that would be so helpful, satisfactory, convincing as to give his genealogy, beginning with his fathers, Judah and Sarah, and come down from father to son until we reach him. We are able to do this, but only because Professor Totten has faithfully scanned the pages of ancient and modern history, and as a result has compiled and given to the world the genealogy of the Sarah branch of the royal family, which was exalted to the throne when the breach was made in the line of arrest in the days of Sedekiah. Culling from a genealogical diagram found in number five of our race, we have the following, Judah begat Sarah, Sarah begat Ethan, Ethan begat Mahol, Mahol begat Kalko, Kalko begat Gadho, Gadho begat Ezru, Ezru begat Shru, Shru begat Heber Scott, Heber Scott begat Boahain, Boahain begat Ayahayamhain, Ayahayamhain begat Tait, Tait begat Agenoin, Agenoin begat Febla Glass, Febla Glass begat Nuanil, Nuanil begat Nuagad, Nuagad begat Aloid, Aloid begat Erkada, Erkada begat Dagfada, Dagfada begat Brada, Brada begat Progan, Progan begat Bile, Bile begat Gollum, Gollum or Gwillam or William, yeah, William the Conqueror of Ireland, yes, that's him, Gollum begat Harriman, or I remember as Eocoid Harriman, who married T. Tefi and Heber and Amergen, his two brothers, okay? The whole genealogy for you guys to follow is all there. This is real people, real history from real annals. The people kept the genealogy. They cannot break this. They cannot debunk this. It's a family line, and it's real, real people. Judah was real, yes. All right, so we actually skimmed through most of the book. Uh, at the end of this book, there's a timeline, genealogical family tree timeline, uh, a list, <laughs> starting with Adam, right? You know, and then it goes into Noah, right? Shem, Arphishat, right? It gets to Heber, right? Peleg, because that's where, you know, the Abraham comes out of, right? And then we got Isaac, Jacob, of course, Judah. <laughs> then we got Judah and Tamar, right? So out of the line of Perez, from Judah and Tamar, you got, you know, Jesse, you get King David, right? King Solomon, King Rehoboam, Abijah, Asa, and so on and so on. You guys see, Manasseh, until he gets to Sedekiah. Remember, Sedekiah is the one that gets killed by Nebuchadnezzar. His uh, daughter, Tephi, and probably other daughters uh, leave with Jeremiah. Eventually, they reach Ireland, right? So kings of Ireland, right? Now, kings of Ireland, Tephi is marrying Heramon a prince of the scarlet thread from the Sarah line. So you got both descendancies of Judah, a female from the King David line and a male from the Sarah line. They got together and then they have, they have their descendants who also become kings of Ireland. Remember, all these people got the stone of destiny, Jacob's pillow. As you guys can see, Ariel Faith, their son, Ithriel, and so on and so on. It goes down the list by generation. A lot of you might know the history, if you know the, the ancient Ireland uh, kings, the annals. You may find these names familiar. Maoen, Dan, Siorna, Sagolach, Ohala, Okain, right, and so on and so on. You guys can see all the lists here of the ancient Irish kings who are coming from the line of Judah. Yes, from the line of Judah, you guys can see. If you want to pause it and take a good look and research all this stuff, but this is something we can... Uh, follow up on it's a good list and then it says here kings of Argonshire. i don't know if that's in scotland so it moves yeah it moves into scotland king fergus moore all right still of line of judah the same line and then dongard conrad Aiden, king eugene king donald the fourth king eugene the fifth and so on again this is in scotland now and the stone of destiny jacob's pillow is traveling with uh, these kings now in scotland King Kenneth II, Constantine, King Donald, Malcolm, Malcolm I, Malcolm II, 
Duncan the first, Malcolm, all Judah, right? And then King David the first. Yeah, of Scotland from 1153, all right? And their chronology. Prince Henry, Robert Bruce, all right? Robert Bruce, isn't that the king of the picks in that movie? Braveheart, Robert Bruce, yeah, line of Judah. Mar Marguerite Bruce, Robert, it keeps going down to Robert Truman, King James I, King James II, King James III, King James IV and the fifth, and then it reaches King James VI, who became the first as well. This is the one we know, the most famous one that chartered the company of Virginia. The one they say authorized the King James Version. Yeah, he's a line of Judah. You see how it got to him? There's Princess Elizabeth, King Frederick of Bohemia, Princess Sophia. So it goes into the females here. King George the First. King George II, Prince Frederick, Wales, King George III, Duke Edward of Kent, Queen Victoria, and so on. Edward the Seventh, all right? According to them, hey, that's what they're saying, right? Something to follow up on, but I just want to say, hey, Mosai did say that Judah will always have somebody in the throne. The scepter will always be with Judah. We return to the book, Judah's Scepter and Joseph's Birthright. An analysis of the prophecies of Scripture in regard to the royal family of Judah and the many nations of Israel. And we belly flop to chapter 8 of this book. It says here, Egypto, Israelitish, and Anglo-Saxon emblems. All right, just like the other book, emblems, right? Go to this part, it says, When Balak, the king of Moab, hired Balaam to curse Israel, and he could not was compelled by Hawa to bless Israel, he said. Hawa brought him forth out of Egypt. He, Israel, has, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. He shall lead up the nations, his enemies, and shall break their bones and pierce them through with his arrows. All right, arrows. He crouched, he lay down as a lion, and as a great lion, who shall stir him up? All right, just want to read that because it's going to say, now, it is most remarkable fact that two of these racial emblems, the lion and the unicorn, which were given to Israel with that compulsory blessing, are in the coat of arms of Great Britain. This insignia, or national seal, is, in part, the Harp of David, which was brought to the Isles by Dan and Simeon, with the unicorn reared on one side and the great lion on the other the lion is both Judah's and Israel's, so also is the unicorn not only Israel's, but Joseph's. And yet, in a special sense, it belongs to Ephraim, because he had the presidents and birthright. Thus Moses, on the day of his death, while he was reiterating and enlarging upon the prophecies and promises made by Jacob, to each of the tribal heads said, concerning the blessings of Joseph, his glory is like the firstling of his bullock and his horns are like the horns of unicorns with them he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth and they are the ten thousands of Ephraim ten thousands of each of the ten tribes and ten thousands of the one tribe of Manasseh the English have not only the lion and the unicorn but they also have that which to them may mean only a circle divided into four quarters still it is really a reproduction of Ephraim's cake for the four quarterings are made by a cross. And one of these quarterings is David's harp, and in each of the other three are young lions. Continue later ahead, it says, Now, it is a significant fact that when Manasseh separated from Ephraim, when the people who became a great nation separated from those who have become a company of nations because their branches have continued to run over the wall, he... Manasseh or America had just 13 states and that 13 is a prominent number in all the emblems and heraldry of the land. The first national flag of those original United States had 13 stars and 13 bars. The bars symbolized the union and the constellation of 13 stars was intended to symbolize the nation formed of 13 independent states. So real quick, right? The great seal, right? In this 
the great seal of our country as represented above, we have the arms and crest of the United States of America. We would first call your attention to the fact that the eagle is holding in what is called the Dexter, Talon, and Olive branch. In the 14th chapter of Hosea, right? Who's Hosea? Hosea is Joshua. Look up Joshua right now. Wikipedia is going to say before he was Joshua, his name was Hosea. That prophet, yeah, he, he has a lot of prophecies, Joshua. We have the following. O Israel, return unto Awah, thy creator. I will heal their backslidings. I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from him. I will be as the dew to Israel, and he shall grow like the lily, the national flower of Egypt, and cast forth his roots as Lebanon, royal cedar. His branches shall spread, and his beauty shall be as the olive tree. Ephraim will say, What have I to do any more with idols? Ephraim is the representative of the house of Joseph. And we have placed this scripture before our readers that they may see that the olive tree is among the insignia of the birthright family and that it is here represented as belonging to one of the branches of the birthright kingdom. And since the birthright is Joseph, it is the olive branch of Joseph, which has been placed in the coat of arms of Manasseh, the 13th tribe in Israel, who has now fulfilled the prophecy of becoming a great nation. Still this fact, if it stood alone, might not mean so much, but in the other talon, which is called the sinister, is a bundle of 13 arrows, which represents a nation individually and collectively prepared for war. It is marvelous that the olive branch should have been made our official insignum of peace, and that the arrows should have been made by the law to represent the war power of the country. For the arrows were in the heraldry of Israel, as well as the unicorn and lion, all right, arrows in the heraldry bows and arrows, come on now, where's the true promised land? So the unicorn, the lion, and arrows. When Balaam was compelled to bless instead of curse them, also the Josephites were bowmen, all right? Bowmen, who's the bowmen? <laughs> Josephites. And Jacob, after speaking of Joseph and his branches, said, the archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. But his bow, munitions of war, a Bodian strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob, right? The creator of Jacob. Wow. It is well known and much rejoice over fact that the bow of the United States, which has sent her arrows into the ranks of her enemies, has always a body and strength, and that both her chief men and people have always said, God has helped us. When Israel marched through the wilderness, she had four standards that were called camp standards. One of these was on the north, one on the east, one on the south, and one on the west. But there were, besides these, a family standard or ensign for each tribe. Hence, Hawa commanded, saying, Every man of the children of Israel shall pitch his own standard with the ensign of their father's house. Afar off about the tabernacle shall they pitch. The object of the camp standards was that when the time came to camp or pitch their tents for the night, the three tribes which belonged to each of these four camp standards might gather to them. The compilers of our reference Bibles understood this, hence they have given the references to the four living creatures of Ezekiel. This book is called Symbols of Our Celto Saxon Heritage by W.H. Bennett. And we continue, it says here, Manasseh. We got the olive branch, right? And the arrows. Remember, they were bowmen. Bow and arrows. Who's the bow and arrow people, right? <laughs> Manasseh. Emblem of America, right? The seal. The primary emblem of the tribe of Manasseh was an olive branch. And in seeking a people who use this emblem today, we need only turn to either a popular or an official emblem of the United States. In either of them, we see that one of the important items is an olive branch. Manasseh's second emblem, a bundle of arrows, is also one of the principal emblems in the arms of the United States. As we see in figure 136, arrows also appear in the arms of Sheffield, Bolton, Barrow, and Furness, Bury, St. Edmunds, and West Suffolk in England, and in Scotland in the crest of Brody, of Brody Butter of Cormac, Cameron of Lochiel, the clan Mark Falling, and on the shields in the arms of Macaulay of Arden Cable. 
In the Netherlands, a bundle of arrows was one of the ancient emblems of that part of the country, originally called Holland. And again, an emblem of the United States. All right, you see the arrows, the stripes, all that has to do with Israelites, that branch, the eagle. Here's some more examples with the arrows holding the hands, Sarah holding the arrows, which is Manasseh, Judah and Manasseh. Back in the book, Judah Scepter and Joseph Birthright. Therefore, concerning a certain land which dwelt by a portion of Israel, we have the following. Ho, or hail, not woe, as in the King James Version of the Scriptures. To the land shadowing with wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, that send of ambassadors by the sea, even in vessels of bulrushes upon the waters, saying, Go, ye swift messengers, to a nation scattered and peeled, to a people terrible from their beginning, Note that, hitherto a nation made it out, measured out by a time of prophecy, which is called the times of the Gentiles, and trotted down whose home or ancient land, the rivers. Now therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth upon them Israel, the waters of the river, strong and many, even the king of Assyria and all his glory, and he shall come up over all his, Israel's channels, and go over all his banks. Have spoiled. All ye inhabitants of the world and dwellers on the earth, see ye when he, the nation shattered with winds, lifteth up an ensign. We have thus parenthesized Isaiah 18, 8, 7 with Isaiah 18, 1, 3, that our readers may know that this land which had set up an ensign of outreached wings was the land of which Israelites were dwelling. For it was the king of Assyria who came up against Ephraim, Israel, overflowed his land and led him into captivity. Prior to this, Moab had once held Israel in derision, and the Lord, in condemning their arrogance, said, He, Israel, shall fly as an eagle and spread his wings over Moab. No wings except those which are spread out can be shadowing wings, and the shadowing wings of Israel's spread eagle are in the ensign of the United States of America. Hence, America is the land shadowed by wings of which Isaiah wrote, whose ambassadors cross the sea in vessels of bulrushes, or literally of cauldrons which absorb water. Example, the modern steamship. The shield or escutcheon, which is borne on the breast of the spread eagle, has 13 pieces called pales or paleways, which comes from the same word as paling or pickets. These 13 paleways are united by one at the top. A said to Abraham, I am thy shield. All right, so this is what they're talking about. Remember, the great seal. Now it's going to talk about certain clouds, right? On the national seal of America, the great people, above the shadowing wings and the scroll is a cloud, emitting in rays of glory. Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel. And behold, the glory of Hawa appeared in the cloud. To our fathers, that glory cloud was significant of the presence of Hawa. The glory cloud which hung over Israel guided those who had just escaped from Egyptian bondage, and it stood between them and their enemies. But this is not all, for this cloud of our American heraldry surrounds what is called the constellation. All right, and now I was going to talk about the other side. It says here the Great Pyramid, the reverse side of America's national seal. This constellation is a group of 13 stars, or planets, on a field of a sure sky which is exactly the same number of planets that appear on the Ashur sky in the dream of Joseph, which drove him into separation from his brethren. Any one of these features in the blazonry of our nation might have been a coincidence, but when we see that there is not a single feature, but that which is Josephic and Israelitish, it is simply astounding. But when we turn our face upon the reverse side of the great national seal, we are overwhelmed, for there stands the great pyramid of Egypt, which is one of the two great monuments of Egypt, the birthplace of Ephraim and Manasseh, the egypto israelitish sons of Joseph, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, and marvel of marvels. So I remember Joseph, he was here. Ephraim and Manasseh, they're from here. Tamari was here. The National Crest of England has the other great monument of Egypt, the Sphinx, on its reverse side. Thus do the people of Great Britain and the United States of America, the brother nations, by that which speaks louder than words, for signs are 
arbitrary say that they are the offsprings of the Egypto Israelitish holders of the Abrahamic birthright. The people of the United States made this declaration by that which was made a law on Thursday, June 20, 1782. For on that day, the ensign which bears those shadowing winds of Israel, together with the heraldry of Joseph, became law among us. Also, over the pyramid on the reverse side of the Great Seal of America is another 13 letter motto, which, of course, is not only lawful but also national. Example. Anuit Coetis, he, Awa, has prospered our undertakings. This also is Josephic, for we read, Awa was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. Awa was with him, Joseph, and that which she did, Awa made it to prosper. <laughs> Try to play it, but you're never gonna beat me Look the other way, what I'm doing ain't easy Bloody hands stain from the people who deceive me Muddy hands break through the chains, go free me Looking for change, looking for pain Pulling a mob, pushing a train I'll never stop, stick to a lane Pick up the pieces and go rearrange uh, I'll be the best above all the rest Put me to the test uh, Expect nothing less, you check as I'm chess, what's happening next, yeah. He got the venom, a tangible weapon, no coming in second, this life is a lesson. He got a new engine from pain, that's a blessing, new focus, no guessing, just bold an obsession. All in his possession, you got the retention, I'll leave an impression and take your redemption. Just kill no discretion, your mind is a weapon, 11, 11, it's time for progression, oh! You could try to play, but you're never gonna beat me. Look the other way, what I'm doing ain't easy. Bloody hands stain from the people who deceive me. Muddy hands break through the chains, go free me. People like sheep move feet, hurt it easy. You don't wanna be fast asleep when they see me. Better stand tall, ready for a fight, believe me. When they try the chains, you can say no, free me. So he's been looking for somebody who could save him Instead of searching inside for what they gave him A strong will, strong mind causes mayhem We could change the world, change times, rearrange them Staying on pace, running the race Life is a chase, I don't want a place I want to be first, work till it hurts Dehydrated thirst till I'm in a hearse oh. High ambitions in the right mind can take you so far It's like you lived a few lifetimes Take off, I'ma break off from the weak minds They can stay soft, you can change lives, you create thoughts Never waste time, you got one shot, you got one life Better pop off, what do you like? Make a dream job No 9-5, no mean boss, just my life and free thoughts You could try to play, but you're never gonna beat me Look the other way, what I'm doing ain't easy Bloody hands stain from the people who deceive me Muddy hands break through the chains, go free me People like sheep move feet, hurt it easy You don't wanna be fast asleep when they see me Better stay tall, ready for a fight, believe me When they try the chains, you can say no, free me